this day for the ability to gather together in your name. Lord, on this uh, eve of our honoring the founding of our nation, the day we declare our independence, we don't want to take for granted the gifts that we experience from, from being citizens of this nation. And part of that is being able just to get together and worship you without fear. And so we thank you for that. We want to honor you and glorify you and praise your name. And we build each other up in you as we do that. Just bless us this day. Amen. 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 All right. Sorry we were late getting started this morning. We had a very busy Sunday school class, and that was cool. And then we had another crisis that I, anyway, so, sorry, uh, but uh, we're here. Awesome. And um, just want to say a big thanks uh, to, uh, to Dave James for covering last week. Uh, I had the, the great joy of being able to officiate uh, Sean Combs' wedding up in Portland last weekend. And, um, Cliff and Diane's son, and so that was a, that was a really, really great joy. Uh, anyway, so, so that's good. Looking at our, our announcements for today, um, we've got under, uh, for today, we've got Youth Night Misted for 6 o'clock, and it sounds like uh, just about Everybody who was going to come, but isn't going to be able to make it, and so we're uh, we're thinking, realizing it's a big holiday weekend, um, that maybe this isn't the best time to have anything. So, um, so all those who might have been planning on coming, we're just going to wait and next week. We'll we'll have our youth night uh, next week at, at six p.m. So, um, just let let you guys know. All right. Then, uh, looking under the announcements, a couple of things. One, uh, Vacation Bible School has been, uh, uh, we're getting ready for that. It's going to be July 25th through 29th. And we've got sign-ups for kids and for volunteers. Uh, a number of us have signed up to, to volunteer for VBS, and that's, that's exciting. Uh, not a lot of kids have signed up at this point, so do get the word out. Uh, if you've got kids or grandkids or neighbor kids or any kids from ages three to uh, fifth grade, so kids going into fifth grade uh, next year, uh, that's 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 the age group this that our BBS is for. So uh, we'd like to have a, a, a pack of kids in there. And right now, I think we've got three volunteers per kid, which could be great, uh, but it might be a little unnerving for them after all. We have a scary so anyway, um, but do, let's get the word out and, and see if we can get some good sign ups for the vacation level school. Um, just, a, just a reminder that uh, we'll be having a, uh, a lunch after service on the 17th. Uh, and, and take some time just to be together and, and just talk about our life together as a church. Uh, so that's coming up in two weeks. Uh, good news, you see over here uh, the story, the need for storage for uh, Marty and Marge clap. <clears throat> that has been taken care of. Thank you. Awesome. So, you know, if you have more storage, you know, that's cool, but they're covered. They're covered now, so that's good. Um, and then the last thing under our announcements <clears throat> is we got a note from the Pregnancy Care Center. Uh, we just got done, you know, a few weeks ago with a baby model boomerang and supported them. But they are also looking for some volunteers. And there's an announcement about that. They're looking for client advocate volunteers. And a lot of us know Jolisa, who's there at the, the, the care center. And she's so crazy awesome. But uh, she's the contact for that. So if that's something you might be interested in and find out more about or, or jumping on in, uh, Jolisa would be the person to talk to. Uh, also want to mention, I've uh, been here for a couple weeks. I, the whole church is under a different uh, phone and internet service now with uh, 
church uh, expressed to them during, during a lot of stuff they've been going through recently, uh, using jazz. So uh, just so glad you guys are here and just blessing time to be with Jesus. Good. All right. Any, any, other, any other announcements for us? Well, let's, let's go into worship together. Would you join me in the call to worship? I love you, O oh Lord. You have equipped me with strength and made my way blameless. You have made my feet like the feet of the deer. You have set me secure upon the heights. The Lord lives, and blessed be my rock, and exalted be the God of my salvation.
raise up our entire hurting world, Lord. There's so much pain and violence and hate and just this place is filled with things that are not of you, God. And we want to stand here this morning and just say that this world is yours. Say that we need shelter in, in you, that we need to turn all this stuff over to you, Lord, for that's the only hope our world has, Lord. That you're the God of this nation, you're the God of this planet, and this universe. And we ask that you take it back, Lord. Just come and take it back. Use us, use your power, however you can, Lord. up to elementary school. Uh, you can go to Sunday school now and follow Carrie over there. I really appreciate that, that last song for a lot of reasons. One is that no matter where we are, God is the God of that place, and he is at work in that place. 
and he's called us to share in that work. Um, and I also appreciate it because one of the one of my favorite writers, uh, first person that said it that I caught it was uh, that the Bible begins with a garden, and a lot of the the artwork that pictures like heaven and eternity is kind of more garden-like, idyllic kind of stuff, but the scriptures end in a city, right? It's the new Jerusalem comes, and it's a big old city. It's like actually a big cube. It's kind of odd when you really take it literally, but the point is we go from a garden with two people to a city filled with people and culture and all kinds of stuff, and that that is what we're moving towards, a truly redeemed city, not just going back to some little garden patch. And uh, I think that's a good, good reminder. So, uh, as I said, it was a privilege to uh, share in the Combs' wedding last week. It was like unbelievable, miraculously uh, perfect day. It was really raining the day before, and it got really hot the day after, and it was just really nice on the wedding day, and it was a beautiful setting, and the bride, Angela, she's just so pretty, and, and Sean was just so, it just was great. Um, and I always feel good when Dave is here and covering, and it's kind of cool because this week, Dave and Ellen are not here because they're celebrating their daughter's wedding. And so we're doing a lot of, it's tis the season, I guess, so yeah. All right, well, I want to pick up where we left off. Uh, we've been working our way through First John. We're actually getting close to wrapping up our walk through First John. And today, our passage is really the heart and the soul of this letter that John wrote to the church. And all those spirals we, we talked about as he keeps going back around and around and around, talking about certain topics, in particular talking about love, this passage is, is, is kind of like the, the crescendo of that. And, and uh, it's, it's a... It's an awesome passage. So let's, let's look at it together. It's 1 John chapter 4, verses 7 through 21. Hear the word of the Lord. Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is is love. In this, the love of God was made manifest among us, that God sent his only Son into the world so that we might live through him. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be the propitiation for our sins. Beloved, if God so loved us, we also ought to love one another. No one has ever seen God. If we love one another, God abides in us, and his love is perfected in us. By this we know that we abide in him and he in us, because he has given us his spirit. And we have seen and testified that the Father has sent his Son to be the Savior of the world. Whoever confesses that Jesus is the Son of God, God abides in him and he in God. So we have come to know and to believe the love that God has for us. God is love, and whoever abides in love abides in God, and God abides in him. By this is love perfected with us, so that we may have confidence for the day of judgment. Because as he is, so also are we in this world. There is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. For fear has to do with punishment, and whoever fears has not been perfected in love. We love because he first loved us. If anyone says, I love God, and hates his brother, he is a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. And this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love 
his brother. It's the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Thanks be to God. Let's pray together. Precious Lord, we love you. And we thank you for your word. We thank you for these words that you inspired your servant John to write and for the revelation that they bring and the inspiration for pointing us to you and to what you have called us to do. So just open our hearts and our minds to you, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So yeah, we've been working our way through John's first letter to the church, and it dawned on me that we haven't really talked that much about John. And he's called St. John, he's called John the Evangelist, he's called John the Theologian. And we actually know a few things about John. First of all, we're pretty sure that he was the youngest of Jesus' disciples. He could have been as young as 13 or 14 when, when Jesus first called him. Could have been a really young guy. We also know that he came from a, an affluent and influential family. His father Zebedee owned a whole fishing business with multiple bo boats and employees. And from what Luke says, there's a chance that Peter and Andrew were actually employees of the Zebedee family. So he's got a big business. And on top of that, John personally knew the high priest, and had access to the high priest's court during Jesus' trial. And on top of that, if you remember, John's mother came and advocated that Jesus would put her two boys, James and John, in places of honor, which suggests a certain sense of privilege. So all this makes us think that John's family wasn't just your common peasantry, but actually was well off. And influential. And we know that, that John was a dear friend of Jesus, a personal friend. He never calls himself by name in his own gospel, if you caught, caught that or not. He calls himself the beloved disciple. So you can figure that out. But anyway, um, but this also may be why Jesus chose John to take care of his mother Mary. Uh, remember from the cross, he, he, he tells John, This is your mom, and to Mary, this is your son. And, and we actually know that, that John did take care of Mary uh, in her later years. Uh, we know that she traveled with him to Ephesus, where John led a group of believers and grew up, uh, grew up there a, a vital community of faith. Um, we, we actually know about that from firsthand pe people who wrote from firsthand experience. Uh, some of the early fathers talked about John and his work in Ephesus. And we also know in his later years that he was exiled to the island of Patmos because of his faith. And while he was on Patmos, he received all kinds of visions of heaven and the end of all things. Which, of course, is what John is most famous for, which is all the writing that he did. John wrote his gospel, which is a masterpiece. He wrote three epistles, 1st, 2nd, and 3rd John. He wrote what is actually technically called the Apocalypse of John, uh, we know it as the book of Revelation. And yet, in the midst of all of this, what is actually most important about John is that he is a key witness. Because of John's special relationship with Jesus, he was put in Jesus' inner core group. The, you could say the 12 were like Jesus' core group, but there was this inner group within the core group. A group was made up of Peter and John's brother James. And so there were a number of key events that John was included in. Uh, along with Peter and James, he was there when Peter's mother-in-law was healed. He was there the, the first miraculous catch of fish. He was there when Jesus raised Jairus' daughter from the dead. He was there and beheld Jesus in his transfiguration when, when he revealed his glory to just those three men. And John was also there with, with Peter and James in the Garden of Gethsemane, witnessing Jesus in his absolute emotional torment, when he was greatly troubled and distressed, when Jesus said himself, my soul is very sorrowful even unto death. 
when Jesus was calling out to his Father and begging to be spared from the cross, but submitting himself to the will of God. And John was the only one of the disciples there at Jesus' trial, hearing Jesus, his, his dear friend and his master, being slandered, watching him being mocked and beaten. And ultimately, John was the only disciple who was there at Golgotha, seeing Romans drive spikes through Jesus' hands and Jesus' feet, securing him to the cross. John watched Jesus' pain and Jesus' torment. He listened to his last words. He bore witness to his last breath. John was the only disciple to actually see Jesus die. So here's the point. When John talks about love, when he describes the price of love and how far love is willing to go, John knows what he's talking about. John spoke from first-hand experience when he said, in this is love. Not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation, the atoning sacrifice for our sins. John saw the pain and the torture. He saw everything that Jesus went through. And he knew that it was all for love. Jesus' love for his Father. Jesus' love for this world. And Jesus' love for you and for me. In this is love. This is John's way of saying this is what love is. This is how love is best defined. This is the greatest, truest, purest manifestation of love that we could ever experience. And this is what God has done. This is what Jesus has accomplished. Through his flesh and blood and and pain and death, through his sacrifice, Jesus demonstrated what love is. He has set the bar. He set the standard for love. He has forever defined it for us and for our lives. And John, who is the one who bore witness to it all, in our passage fleshes out the significance of it all for us and for our lives. And John tells us three powerful truths in our passage. Three things that are absolutely essential if we are to know and to love and to follow after Jesus. And the first of these things is the most important truth of all. The truth that God is love. This truth is so important that that John actually says it twice in our passage. And it's incredibly profound. Saying that God is love tells us that love is the very nature of God. It is at the heart of who God is. It's at the heart of his holiness and his righteousness, his power and his authority, his justice and his judgment. Love is how God defines himself. It's the chief quality of his character. It's the primary motivation of his will. It's the unifying goal of everything that God thinks and feels and says and does. Over the millennium, there have been so many ideas about God. So many mythologies and and philosophies and religions. So many ways that people have tried to understand the person who is behind everything. Life and being. And some ideas have been better than others. But when God himself wanted to reveal his true nature to us, to share with us who and what he really is, he sent his son to join us in our humanity and to suffer, and to die for us on the cross. And through all, to win for us his salvation and restore us to life in him. Romans 5.8 says, God proves his love for us and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. 
God is love. And what John saw with his own eyes and what he touched with his own hands in the life and death and resurrection of Jesus confirmed this beyond any doubt and established this glorious truth for all time. If you ever find yourself wondering about God, wondering if there's anybody out there, wondering if he thinks about you, if he cares about you, and if he loves you and wants the best for you, just look to the cross. Call to mind God's motivation for sending his son into this world and embrace the love that Jesus has demonstrated for you and his sacrifice on the cross. And when you do, all doubts begin to fade. You are loved. You are loved dearly. You are loved beyond all measure by the Lord and creator of everything that is. And that's awesome. Amen? Yeah, you can say amen. It's cool. You can go like, amen. That's cool. I like it. All right, good. So that's the first thing. Now, along with this is the truth that God empowers us to love as well. Our passage from 1 John tells us two powerful things about how God equips us to live out his love together. And the first thing is this, that we can love powerfully because we are powerfully loved. John says we love because he first loved us. We can live in love because God first loved us. He first poured out his love on us, proving his love for us through Jesus. God loved first. And that is a really big deal. Because being truly loved is incredibly liberating. Being known and accepted and valued. And with that, being desired and pursued being embraced beyond all limits, being adored beyond all reason, being treasured beyond any quality or merit or accomplishment of our own, it's staggering. And it frees us up to live in love together. One of the main reasons that we don't love is fear. Fear puts us in a defensive posture. We feel the need to protect ourselves, to protect ourselves from pain, from loss. We feel like if we give our love, we may be rejected, we may be betrayed, or we may be taken advantage of, or even deeply disappointed. And we fear that we will lose ourselves in all of that pain, in all of that loss. And so we push each other away. But being first loved by God, knowing that we are loved and that we are treasured based on the character and the quality of God's own heart, we no longer need to fear. We no longer need to build our identity on our own fallen qualities or on the acceptance of very fallible people. John says there is no fear in love, but perfect love casts out fear. Being perfectly loved by God, we don't need to fear. And being freed from fear, we are free to share in God's love together. So that's the first thing. And it's, it's really good. The second way that God empowers us to love is by investing his own spirit within us. John says, by this we know that we abide in him and he in us because he has given us his spirit. Through our faith in Jesus and and committing ourselves body and soul to embracing his grace and to honoring his authority and to following him with love and devotion, we open our hearts to become vessels of the Holy Spirit, communing with his presence and with his love and, and being filled with his power being ready and willing to produce the fruit of the Spirit in our lives. This is one of the most amazing things about our faith, about the faith that Jesus calls us to share in, 
And it's the fact that it's not just a matter of our knowing and believing the right things and, and performing the right functions and, and, and avoiding the wrong things and all the pitfalls that are so typical in our world. What Jesus has called us to is himself. Communing with him. Sharing in his presence and his power and his love. And with his spirit abiding in us, equipping us to do all that he has called us to do. God loved us first. He redeemed us through Jesus' sacrifice. And he has poured himself out for us. And all of it, all of it equips us. It empowers us to live out his love together. And that is incredibly good news. Now, it's incredibly good news because God actually does expect us to love. This is really the whole thrust of our passage this morning. The fact with God being love and God equipping us to love, God really does expect us to be living out his love together. As John says, if anyone says, I love God, but hates his brother, he is a liar. John, John, John uses that word a lot. Have you picked up on that? We don't use that word a lot. We don't go, liar. Maybe, maybe you do. But most in like pleasant company, we don't. But John does it because it's true. If you say, I love God, but hate your brother, you are a liar. For he who does not love his brother whom he has seen cannot love God whom he has not seen. John tells us this commandment we have from him, whoever loves God must also love his brother. And this goes all the way back to Jesus. Jesus is the one who said, this is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. Now we can look at this in a couple of ways. On the one hand, we can recognize that God's loving us is an investment in us. God is love, and he has shared himself with us. He shared his love with us so that through us, we can share his love with each other, and ultimately with the world as a whole. You and I are called to be living representatives of Jesus Christ in this world of his presence and his power and his love at work in our world, making all things new. And the number one way that we can represent Jesus is through living out his love together and with the people around us. This is why Jesus said, By this all people will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus said, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. And those good works are loved, lived out, demonstrating the power of God's love alive and at work in us and through us. So that's one way that we can understand God's expectation for us to love, that we are to represent him and represent his love in this world. Another way that we uh, can understand God's expectation on us to love is by recognizing that as we say yes to Jesus, as we embrace him, as we embrace him as the Son of God and the Lord of heaven and earth, as the one true Savior, then we enter into his grace. We enter into his loving acceptance of us and his invitation to commune with him. And Jesus is clear that as we enter into his grace, his grace becomes our life. His grace becomes our world. It becomes our new reality. And living within that reality means being free to experience the love of God with all of its benefits. Experiencing the peace and the joy of sharing in his love. Enjoying living a living and loving relationship both with God and with each other. But if we refuse to love each other, if we refuse to share in the grace of God with anyone and everyone, we are no longer living within the grace of God. We are no longer sharing freely in his love. 
Hatred is the antithesis, the exact opposite of love. And as such, if we are going to insist on harboring hatred for each other, we cannot possibly remain in the world of grace. We cannot continue to share in communion with God. John said something that is so profound in our passage. He said, Beloved, let us love one another, for love is from God, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. But anyone who does not love does not know God, because God is love. God is is love. Love is his very nature. And so knowing God and being born of God and entering into his life, and into his world, making God our living reality means we need to connect with him. We need to connect with his truth, with his nature. We need to shape and mold ourselves around his heart and his life and his world. And so love is the key. Love is is the connection. Love is a necessity. And thank God that he has shown us what love is and he has equipped us and empowered us for love that his expectation, his, his command to love is in reality an invitation. An invitation to share more deeply in him and to enjoy his love more fully in our lives. 2,000 years ago, God told us that love is the key. And then God defined what love is. He manifested the full breadth of love for us. And he did it through the body and the blood of his son, Jesus Christ. St. John, John the Apostle, John the Evangelist, John the Theologian knew this in an intimate way. He bore first hand experience, a personal witness to the life and the suffering and the death of Jesus Christ and to the power and the joy and the glory of his resurrection and his life with us. In this is love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the atoning sacrifice for our sins. May we embrace the love of God, putting our faith in Jesus Christ, opening our hearts to the power of his spirit and living out his love together for the glory of his name and for the great good of our world. Amen? Amen. 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 Let's pray together. Precious Lord, we love you. And we do, again, thank you for your word. What an incredible passage that you inspired your dear friend John to write for us. You are love. And you have shared yourself so fully, so beautifully with us. And in that, you've called us to share in your nature and in your life and in your mission in this world. Help us. Help us to truly Embrace your love for us. Help us to find that, that, that power, that, that sweet richness that comes from the knowledge of your love. And spur us on so that we can and will live out your love together and shine your light in this world. Bless us, we pray, Jesus, so we can bring you glory. In your name, amen. Please stand together once more to worship.
pray and dedicate our tithes and our offerings to the, to, to the Lord. Precious Lord, we love you. And we're so aware of all that you have given for us. And we receive what you have given knowing that what you gave was given out of love. It wasn't to create a, a crushing debt or or a lifetime of guilt and shame. It was to liberate us, to set us free, to deliver us from fear and death so that we can truly live in your love and in your life. And so we give you thanks. Lord, we know that your work is far from complete, that you have your hands on this world that you are seeking to lead people and nations to you so that they could humble themselves, so they could set aside pride and greed and and all the other trappings of this world and know your love and your grace and your truth and your life. Stir in our hearts a desire to be a part of your work in this world, to live out your love with each other and with with everyone else. And today we ask that you would receive these gifts, these tithes, these offerings, and just ask that you would lead us in how best to apply them to your work, to your mission of grace and truth. We thank you that we can be a part of it and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.
Let's pray together. Precious Lord, we love you. And again, we just, just give you thanks. Thanks for the incredible love that you have demonstrated for us, that you have, you have proved for us in the life of your Son. And Lord, we know that we continue to live in a, in a broken world, in a world that is experiencing the impact of, of sin and, and selfishness and, and pride and greed and hatred and, and, and everything else, and that we all suffer from it on every level. And so our lives we lift to you. Our needs we lay before you. We ask for your grace and your mercy, for your deliverance, your salvation, to be at work in our lives. But through it all, Lord, we look mostly to you and the great gift of your love and the great hope that we have that you have shared your salvation with us. That though this time is necessary, we will share in the full glory of your kingdom. And we look towards that day with hope and anticipation. So be with us now and lift our, hope, our hearts to yourself, we pray. And as we pray the, the prayers that are in our hearts, we, we pray the prayer that your son taught us. As we say, our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Amen. Let's prepare our hearts to share in the great gift of our Lord, the bread and the cup, as they call our minds and our hearts back to that expression of love in his body and his blood. Amen. pray together. Precious Lord, we love you. We thank you once again for your grace. We thank you for the great price that that grace cost you, the life of your son. And as we receive this bread and this cup, help us to be mindful the magnitude of your gift to us and help us to receive your love, to embrace it, to let it fill our lives to overflowing so that we can live out your love together. Claim our hearts for yourself, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. On the night that our Lord was betrayed, he had gathered his disciples together to share with them in one final meal. And in the course of that meal, our Lord took bread and he gave thanks for that bread. And then he broke it. And he gave that bread to his disciples saying, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, our Lord took the cup, and again he gave thanks. And he gave the cup to his disciples, saying, This is the cup of the new covenant, formed for the shedding of my blood for the forgiveness of sins. As we take of the bread and of the cup, 
Let us remember all that our Lord has done for us by giving himself on the cross. Let us be mindful of his presence and empower with us even now, calling us to commune with him and to share in his great work in this world. And let us look forward with hope and anticipation to sitting with him at his supper table in the advent of his eternal kingdom. Let us celebrate our Lord together.
Let's pray together. Precious Lord, what a great, great thing it is to share in your presence with us, your body, your blood, your, your love for us. We have tasted and seen that you are good. You have blessed us and filled us up. We just pray that we can receive from you and go from this place and shine your light and share your love with all that we meet. We love you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Sure, you will please stand once more and worship. groups, we looked at this 27th Psalm as a, as a prayer to, to direct towards Jesus. And, and there's that great line you know, that says, I am confident that I will see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Not just saying, okay, you know, we'll get through this and then we'll die and I'll be great. But actually believing that he is with us, that he is at work, that he is sharing his goodness and his love and his grace and his power with us. And that's true. That's a big part of the promise that he's made to us. Is he is love. And he has shared his love with us. He's proved his love for us. And he made the promise that he will be with us always to the end. So as we receive those promises and as we in obedience respond to his call to live in love, with the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the love of our Heavenly Father, and the presence and power of the Holy Spirit be with us all. Amen. <laughs>